So Paolo really raised the bar with the loudness of the voice, and as a Greek now, I have to scream my way through the presentation, right? So, uh, but it's truly a pleasure to be um, at the peer meeting and having this opportunity to share some of uh, the work that we have been um, doing on the liquefaction of gravelly soils. So gravels liquefy, we've seen that um, in the past, uh, but I think what has been uh, more important is how it has been highlighted by more recent events, and even more so the impact it has had on critical infrastructure such as ports. Um, impact on infrastructure is always very helpful to make the case as to why it's important to um, study the response of certain types of soils, especially challenging ones like gravels. And to tie this with the theme uh, of the annual meeting, I do want to just take a minute to um, share the story of what that impact can be and how these things can work and go from something that may seem a little bit obscure, such as the dynamic response of gravelly soils, all the way to impacting infrastructure. Um, so one of the case studies I'll share um, a little bit later comes from the earthquake in uh, Greece, in the island of Kifalonia. Uh, we see on the map here uh, the faults outlined, and we see the location of several of the ports that the island has. Um, and there was severe damage in two of the ports, Luxuri and Arbostoli. Um, and then, um, and that was due to the liquefaction of gravels. And so boats could not um, dock to provide um, important and necessary supplies. And when we tried to do that through um, the other two ports that I have, which uh, would be Sami and uh, Poros on the east side, what happens is that um, then further liquefaction and landslide effects will cut off the transportation. Um, and so um, they ended up in this case having to mobilize the military to be able to, um, you know, helicopter in supplies. And so this is how you can go, you know, from something like the liquefaction of gravels to really having a very severe impact that the population in a given area um, is going to impact. And so it's really important, and this is what I've enjoyed in, this, in these two days of this meeting, um, to really see how all these components um, come together and have this be highlighted as much uh, as it has been. Now with gravels, what happens is that we don't have types of tools like the ones I have on my screen that I'm sure many of you uh, recognize, where people have spent um, you know, decades um, and, and um, a lot of uh, resources developing. Um, and even more so, when it comes to characterizing the gravels in the field, there's additional challenges due uh, just purely to the size of the particles of this material. Um, so we have, uh, you know, of course, some options available to us, but they all come with their own set of challenges. So we can have the biker penetration test, which is uh, very familiar to this side um, of the world, with its high um, mobilization costs, um, the need to correlate back to other existing correlations that have actually not been developed for gravel, and the uncertainty that that can draw into your process. Um, we have an, uh, a test that has been used more so um, recently, the dynamic penetration test, and I'll spend a little bit more time on that. And then we have the non-invasive techniques that can also come with some challenges, but also some great advantages for sites like me. When we go into the lab, things continue, unfortunately, to be challenging, again, because of the particle size. So large particle size means that your devices now have to be larger. Uh, and again, that uh, increases cost, time, but also starts now bringing some other effects that you have to deal with. So for example, uh, this is the large scale triaxial cyclic device that um, is, uh, well, was hosted uh, in the Richmond Field Station. Um, and so in placing uh, gravel um, in, in this device, you are dealing with membrane effects and, and whatnot that you have to then correct for. So in looking at the response of this material, we uh, have decided to take an integrated approach, uh, much like the comment that was uh, just made, that you really have to try and learn the best from all the different methods, right? And put all of that together to help you advance. So just because something is wrong with one field test doesn't mean we have to move away from field testing altogether, right? Or it doesn't mean that miracle modeling is going to give you all the answers either. And so we're really trying to bring on all the components together and learn and hopefully uh, paint the whole picture. Now today, obviously, because of time, I can't discuss uh, everything, but I will touch upon some highlights of our laboratory testing and then uh, finish off with some key points from the field testing and the field response. So in terms of the laboratory testing, um, to help us deal with the large size of particles, uh, we developed at the University of Michigan a large size cyclic signature device. 
Now, the good news is that we are going to be moving it soon uh, to UC Berkeley, since uh, this is where we're going to be continuing with this work. Uh, but just to show you a little bit about uh, the device, what you see is where the specimen container would be. Um, so we have uh, uh, a series of stacked rings that are Teflon coated to reduce um, friction between them. Uh, this is what the specimen looks like inside of it. You see the membrane. Uh, the membrane there is just for cushioning and protecting the rings. It's not engaged at the top or the bottom with the specimen and therefore it's not adding additional uh, resistance. And later on, we've been running actually most of our tests even without that cushion membrane uh, altogether. The other very exciting part in my mind about this device is that because we were able to do it ourselves, we have a lot of custom elements to it. And one of those has to do with being able to measure the shear wave velocity of every specimen that we test. Before, after, during, you know, we go a little bit crazy with VS. Uh, but I think that that gives us very important information. And we're able to do that uh, using uh, two different systems, either vendor elements or accelerometers. And we have, of course, made sure that the results between the two systems are consistent. So the preference for gravel leans closer to the accelerometers just because the vendor elements kept getting damaged because of the type of the material. Now, in terms of the types of the materials that we've been testing, um, and again, this kind of goes back to, you know, take everything with its good and bad. With laboratory testing, you have the controlled conditions, which is good, but you have to reconstitute your material. And so that means that you have to start somewhere and then build in the complexity, hopefully getting as close to field response as possible. And I think that Nick uh, Siddhar uh, earlier today made a good point about the importance of fabric, for example, in the response and how we may never be able to uh, perfectly mimic that in the lab, and that's where the field response comes in handy to complete that uh, puzzle. So we did um, different types of gravels because we were targeting different sizes of particles and also different angularity. And then <coughs> recognizing, of course, that you know uh, we very seldom have just purely uh, clean uniform gravels, we have added um, sand to the mix, and recently we've been adding more grain sizes, and this is the ongoing part uh, of the work. And of course, again, a reminder that we have the shear velocity measurement for every specimen in addition to what you would normally monitor for a laboratory test. Now, the final piece of the puzzle in characterizing this material is that we can also do uh, what we have at Michigan, which is called the translucent segregation test, which gives you basically um, selfies of all the particles that you have in your, uh, in your specimen. And this is great because you can use that to get a distribution of your aspect ratio. Um, you can uh, use that to really try and get after angularity and that sort of thing. Now, I recognize this is not a 3D imaging of each particle, right? So there's always going to be that other dimension, and that comes in at play a little bit with the statistics when you get into the numerical modeling. But it's definitely, I would argue, a much better characterization of what's in that specimen, right, than we would normally have. Now, um, we start off with certain expectations when we run tests, right? We don't just put a material in there and see what we get. We have some <coughs> models in mind, have some types of behaviors that we would be expecting, and then you hopefully either see that you know you uh, you are similar to that or you're different, and you try to explain why. And so for gravels, we would expect um, that we would follow a similar critical state-based framework, such as the one that we've been using for granular soils where you see this type of difference in behavior depending in if you're looser uh, versus denser, right? So uh, the looser being the blue aligned to the denser being the red. Now, I will stand on one significant part of the laboratory testing, which I think doesn't get addressed as much as we think it should, given the effect that we have seen in the results, and that's the concept of true constant volume conditions. So our tests are being run under constant volume conditions. Uh, and so what that means is that you maintain your constant volume. Uh, and to do that, you, uh, the device basically will adjust that vertical uh, load that it has to apply, right? And you interpret that as the uh, generation of the excess pore pressure that you would have in the field. Uh, and that type of test has been done, uh, routinely so. But what hasn't been very well documented is how do we know if we have true constant volume conditions? And so it is addressed a little bit in the ASTM and only for monotonic uh, type of testing, not uh, cyclic at all. And what we have seen with our results is that it makes a difference, and sometimes a very significant difference. So what you see, just draw your attention only to two lines for now, the solid black and the solid red. Um, because the solid line, uh, the black one, meets the ASTM threshold criteria. 
okay? Now with our device, again, because you know we've been able to make it and then play with it ourselves, we have even better controls and we can maintain that vertical strain even closer to zero, which would be your theoretical perfect constant volume conditions. And you see what that means in terms of the peak stress that you would see in the far left of the screen between the black solid line and the red solid line. Now, even more, we see that the same thing on cyclic testing. So what you see here in the two lines, the dashed black and the red, are two tests where everything is the same apart from the settings of the device that are improving or not your ability to control that vertical strain. And so now you see changes in the number of cycles to liquefaction and some other critical aspects that become even more important if you're giving this type of results to a considerative modeler to develop their model. Okay, because now they're basing their model on perhaps data that are being affected on your ability to be as close to constant volume conditions as possible. And so this is just something I want to highlight. I can't spend more time on this. I have the, the ASTM paper at the bottom there, but we have been recommending an even further reduction than the recommended uh, threshold uh, if you really want to be able to say that you are doing constant volume conditions. Because we were able to characterize the angularity, we were also able then through our test to show the effect that our angularity has. And what I really uh, like is, in addition to the other colorful lines in the, in the left, is this little figure on the right where you have um, points from tests, both gravel and sand, and what the difference that it makes in terms of the results, uh, in this case it's peak stress versus your vertical um, effective stress, is angularity. So you see basically the points along the, um, the solid black line is the rounded particles, both sand and gravel, right? Granular materials, same type of framework, but it's really the angularity that separates you. And then on your dashed line, you have again all the points for both sand and gravel where the um, difference is again uh, the, that they are the angular particles. Uh, another thing that being able to measure the shear wave velocity of each specimen uh, we, were, we had the option to do uh, is to keep track of the correlation of the peak stress for the specimens of the tests of the results from the monotonic testing with the VS. And not surprisingly, you see that that correlation starts to break down going from the peak stress to then the phase transformation to the ultimate um, state, right? Why? Well, because they all happen at very different levels of strain. So, of course, the closer you are to elastic or, you know, the early stages of the nonlinear behavior, the better the correlation would be with a property like the shear wave velocity that focuses on small strain. And, of course, as you get to the larger strains, that correlation will, will break down, and we're fine with that, right? Now, um, just to show you some example um, cyclic tests. Um, these are tests for our pea gravel, which is our rounded material. And you see two tests being compared here, uh, the red being the looser 47% relative density and the black being the 87% um, the uh, relative density. You see the respective shear wave velocities there. Um, and you see uh, similar results for the mixes, sand and gravel. But now, if I kind of go back and forth between uh, these slides, what you're going to see is the change of the number of cycles to liquefaction. So we're close between 6 and 8 here, whereas here now we're up to um, 16, 17, 18. So we would expect these types of mixes to have an increased resistance to liquefaction. We do see that. Um, and so, as I said, you know, we're going to be adding more to the mix as we go. Of course, initial shear stress conditions are important if you're on a slope, if you're under a building, and so we have also incorporated some K-alpha type testing, as we call it, and you see uh, basically here that the, the material basically responds like it's on a slope, right? And so all the strain now is developing uh, a preferential direction towards uh, one direction, and this is the difference between the black and the red line, and then the dashed black, which has an even uh, larger um, alpha. So it's, it's really nice to bring everything together under a unified framework where you can have your monotonic response, your cyclic, your post-cyclic, and have everything make sense so that this is not a cartoon out of a book. This is my actual real laboratory data, right? And this really just makes you feel good about um, you know, the ability to, uh, to perform these types of tests. The other thing that we can look at, as I said, that I think is really important is what happens after, right? That question that we all ask, okay, it's gonna trigger, so what? Uh, and so basically this kind of addresses the so what in looking basically at what is the strain uh, that's happening, 
uh, after you, you lose your shear stress, we see the difference here again between uh, the clean, uh, the, the gravels and the more angular uh, gravels. We can measure the shear wave velocity during that process. So you see the velocity drop almost to zero when you're losing your stiffness after liquefaction, and then it's picking up again at that upper right corner. And you can also look at post-liquefaction settlement, right? Reconsolidation settlement. Now, the good news is that so far in our results, they have been, again, a reminder, uniform gravels or sand and gravel mixes, but the numbers are coming out to be less than what would be predicted by uh, all the, um, the predictions that we have now for sandy materials. Now, to kind of quickly use my last five minutes or so for the field testing component, we have been, uh, again, trying to bring in the field response of, of these materials to, again, complete the puzzle. And we've been doing that in several different sites. This is as part of a collaboration with uh, Kyle Rollins and Dimitri Zekos uh, in a, through an NSF project. And um, for the sake of time, I'll just pick uh, randomly one of these places to discuss, uh, the Kifalunya port. <laughs> um, so, because, you know. Uh, so uh, basically you see an overview of one of the ports that I discussed before that experienced the damages. Um, Dimitri Zekos was there, um, a part of the gear team, to be able to measure the post-earthquake performance and collected important data. And then we were lucky to be able to visit later on to perform some additional testing. And so that additional testing is the dynamic penetrometer test that I mentioned before. Uh, I, I, it has been gaining traction and I hope to uh, help it gain more traction because I think it has a lot of promise in these types of materials. And basically what it consists is this type of cone that you would attach to your almost normal um, drill rig equipment, the equipment you would use for an SBT test, uh, and perhaps even similar energy, but you may want to increase that uh, to go deeper. We make energy measurements and then uh, while we're driving and basically we're collecting blow counts. So it's something that you know we feel comfortable with, but of course now it's gonna come with its own sets of correction uh, factors and whatnot. And um, you know, I know uh, we won't get into the debate of whether size matters, but we have also made some bigger uh, DPTs as well because I think it's important to understand also the impact that that makes, right? What is What are you driving into the ground and how big is it relative to what it is that you're driving it? Uh, into and so we're going to be uh, looking at that in the future. We did our own VS measurements while we were there to have our VS profiles and so some of the things that we can do in the field is create these side-to-side -side profiles uh, to correlate the shear wave velocity uh, as you're driving through these deposits with your DPT blow counts which is that N120 uh, number and so you see how they can correlate uh, for the two different ports just uh, picking one of the locations. We can also then use that from all the locations we've performed the testing to come up with correlations between DPT and uh, shear wave velocity, if that's something that we want to do. We are um, exploring capabilities of uh, including more sensors into the DPT to collect even more information about the energy that is being delivered where the test essentially is being performed. Um, and so that's something, again, that's part of ongoing work. And so at the end of the day, when we're able to do this at these sites, and we've been able to do this now at several locations, not just the ones that I showed, it's gonna be really a, a very nice complement to the laboratory component because you have sites that you have observed a certain type of response after an event, right, with measurements. Um, this is something that we're extremely lucky to get with the gear reports, for example. Um, and then uh, at more and more of these sites, I would argue, but definitely for the Catalonia Island, we can have ground motion uh, being recorded, time histories that are at these sites are fairly close, so we feel comfortable that we know that we can characterize the shaking. We have uh, known stratigraphy through the site investigation that you can do, both before and after the event. Um, and then adding uh, that uh, DPT testing that I was saying. And so to finish off, where we're going with this is to be able now to look at these types of curves and look, for example, at the top row um, and see what it looks like for the laboratory results, but then also go to the bottom row and see what this looks like for the, the field performance. And so now in the field, having uh, very high quality uh, case studies with really good data is critical in now back analyzing them to really understand 
where these points should be on these types of graphs, CSR versus blow count. Essentially, this is what we're doing. But we are now trying to develop that coming from three, four, five different directions and develop something robust that we can use for the characterization now of gravelly material, which is something that doesn't exist. We have seen that we can get this uh, material to liquefy with uh, shear wave velocities in excess of 200 meters per second in the laboratory, and this has also been uh, uh, happened in the field as well. And so this 200 meter per second cutoff that you know may have existed or you know exists is actually not something that we have been seeing again both in the lab and the field. And so I think what's critical is that we need to, again, bring all these scales together from, from micro, which would have been my DM work if I had time to present it, all the way to macro scale for the field response. I think all the pieces have something unique to give us. And so I think it's really important to interrogate all of that, uh, keep the parts that um, are important for the response, and try and build something that's going to be uh, very robust. So with that, of course, none of that happens by one person. There's a huge team behind that does uh, a lot of this work. As I mentioned, Kyle and Dimitri the collaborators, but also a lot of uh, students who uh, um, are still working or have graduated since, and of course, a lot of funding from different types of agencies and entities. And so with that, I would like to thank you very much.